The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Network. Parker, I am your host, and it is a very pleasure to be with you this Sunday. So, it is uh, a uh, world that we have uh, that we have uh, awakened in this uh, this last week. Uh, we have a a world uh, that is on the brink of uh, multinational war. We have the, the reports from the United Nations uh, as of yesterday, uh, 364 civilian deaths had been confirmed in Ukraine since Russia invaded in, uh, on February 24th. Uh, but the real figure is, uh, is likely to be considerably higher the United Nations High Commission on Refugees reports that more than 1.5 million people have fled the Ukraine since Russia invaded. Of course, Russia denies, uh, denies targeting civilians, saying it's carrying out a quote-unquote special military operation against, quote, Ukrainian nationalists and neo-Nazis. Uh, but the deputy prime minister of Ukraine uh, has said only about an hour ago that Russia is indeed striking civilian targets, including hospitals, nurseries, and schools. Uh, her name is Olga uh, Stefanishnya, and I'm going to quote her right now. She says, uh, she was talking to the BBC's uh, Sunday morning program uh, that uh, shelled hospitals, the shelled houses for kindergartens and schools and ordinary households. This is how reality looks. Uh, she also said that Ukraine was seeing another wave of this terrorist plan of the Russian Confederation. Of course, Russia is suffering losses as well, but Ms. Stefania, Stefanishnia says that that does not deter Russia. It only encourages further aggression. So if you've been paying attention, you, you know that the world, uh, well, not the world, but many countries in the world have, by freezing assets, by declaring no-fly zones, by shipping military equipment to the Ukraine. Uh, no doubt you will have heard uh, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky uh, in any of his uh, incredible uh, appeals for both aid and also a cessation in these hostilities. And, and the truth is that we had been in a world where we had an anticipated that this kind of action, state versus state, was finished, or at the very least, highly unlikely. And today on the political review, we are going to consider uh, what the war in Ukraine might mean for us here in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas and uh, on a larger scale for us in the Caribbean community. Uh, to help me work through this uh, very complicated question, 
today is my old friend Brownstown himself, uh, the inimitable Hubert Edwards. Mr. Edwards, welcome again to the Political Review. Thank you, Quincy. It's certain to be here with you to discuss, uh, as we will, to the best of our ability, um, this very, very complex and important issue which is taking place in the world today. Yeah. The before we start, uh, Hubert, I wanna uh, I wanna play uh, a little clip uh, from a show I did on Wednesday on uh, Guardian Talk Radio, and uh, we spoke with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who was uh, at the CARICOM meeting, and uh, and he had uh, he had some things to say about his expectations for how the war would affect uh, the Bahamas. So, uh, Wally, if you would please play that clip. My question is, how do you think the war uh, that Russia is prosecuting against the Ukraine will affect the Bahamas? Well, the, the problem for us is uh, that we have, uh, as the number one um, contributor to our GDP, the tourism sector, and this is a highly sensitive sector, just locations of the world. So when you have war or threats of war, people start getting afraid to leave their homes. And of course, tourism depends on people leaving their homes to come and be where we are. So it's a cause, cause of immediate concern. And then secondly, uh, war tends to breed um, economic depression, collapse, sometimes inflation. So people start holding on to their money. And again, uh, since tourism is a, uh, the net effect of it is people will be keeping money in their pockets and not uh, not traveling overseas. Uh, of course, this comes hard on the heels of, uh, of the uh, pandemic, which we're just trying to, and um, at the moment, we're just trying to get back upon our feet after two years of, of, uh, of recession. Mm -hmm. uh, is it, is it uh, fair to say, or do you think the, uh, do you think the effects will be uh, more widespread than limited just to the tourism sector? Well, I started with tourism because uh, that's the bread and butter of the country. And so if that's affected, then everything is affected. I mean, you just had to sue years uh, when there was no, when there were no U.S. dollars on the streets in New Providence and the rest of the country. Uh, spending was depressed and people themselves were depressed because there was no money. Um, right now, for example, uh, down here at the, uh, at the CARICOM conference, the Caribbean uh, Hotel Association, the Caribbean Tourism Organization are all um, being advised by the private sector in uh, the region that we have to scrap all of these restrictions on travel to our country because we are now putting ourselves in a competitive disadvantage uh, to our competitors. So the, we have all these restrictions. The Dominican Republic has scrapped all their restrictions. Mexico has scrapped all their restrictions. And so uh, their, their gain are uh, the two destinations. So the commercial sector in our region is saying, look, uh, heads of government have to make the hard decision that we have to uh, live with this virus and scrap all these restrictions. Otherwise, uh, we're going to lose our shirts economically. And uh, this is uh, a highly persuasive argument. Not sure which direction it will go in, but I already announced that it has scrapped everything except the requirement for a test uh, 72 hours before you travel there. That really should be, I guess, across the board, the position. Wow. So the the reason that I that I that I ask uh, the follow up question is, of course, because Russia and the, and the Ukraine are, I think, between the two of them they are responsible for a third of the world's wheat exports. And of course, you know that, that that's going to affect the price of things like flour, which is going to have uh, an effect on, on the cost of food. Uh, so th there's also the food security question as well, eh? Um, they're talking about tourism because all the inputs into tourism, of course, will be, um, you know, that the Bahamas imports uh, virtually 99% of its food inputs and other, other inputs to everything that we do. Um, so, uh, 
whatever the price uh, increases take place will have a knock-on effect um, throughout throughout the throughout the sector, um, which is why uh, this this whole action of the interruption to world commerce, uh, every these sanctions that they're imposing, uh, you know, against uh, the rulers of these countries who are engaged in this uh, adventurism in Ukraine. Um, all of this is just leading to dislocations uh, throughout the whole economic system uh, of the world. Uh, oil prices, for example, are going sky high, and that, that also is going to affect us. I think uh, the press quoted me a couple of days ago as saying that some people were predicting that be a, there'd be an $8 a gallon uh, price for gas. Our socks off because uh, this is hugely expensive, and... Uh, and you know you just don't know uh, where it's all going to end. Mm. So it is in the best interest of uh, the world, actually, for this to stop. And uh, but the fellow who's in charge in uh, in Russia uh, does not have any uh, sympathetic air. And I, I was quite surprised because I just stepped out of a meeting where um, the Prime Minister of um, of uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who's Ralph Gonzalez, has just written a very strong letter to uh, President Putin. They are quite uh, close friends with the Russian Federation, uh, St. Vincent and the Liberty Council, and they quite frankly said that this is wrong and that you have to you have to put an end to it because it is not it is not in the best interest of the world, and it isn't. Uh, but uh, he has a mistaken view of history. Uh, and uh, and a view that uh, their security interests are threatened by what happened uh, in Ukraine, and that's the reason he's taking the action. But of course, it's a bathwater. And and there is also the possibility that 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 uh, he's uh, throwing up a smokescreen because all he really wants to do is reconstitute the USSR. But that's but that's uh, yes. my view. You wouldn't. Uh, yeah. uh, that's why that's why I said he has a mistaken view of history. Yeah. Um, the the, the uh, typical uh, response uh, of of uh, Russians who support him and people who support him was one is I see a pushback going throughout the region that uh, George Bush went into Iraq, Obama went into Libya, and essentially uh, the American military machine ruined those countries, uh, killed uh, tens of thousands of people, and nobody from this region spoke up when those things happened. Well, that fact. Um, but um, people are saying, well, if the Americans did it and got away with it, then why can't uh, why can't Russia do it? Since they are uh, perceived that their security interests are threatened. Well, the first response to that, of course, is assuming that uh, the Americans were wrong, uh, that or, or that the uh, the wrong in Libya or in Iraq. Uh, two wrongs don't make a right in this situation. The principle is that the United Nations Charter that we signed on to says that there must be uh, the inviolability of territorial uh, territorial lines. Um, this has been so in Africa where uh, the colonial powers drew up lines without regard to uh, the uh, nation states that existed in Africa, uh, causing many, many problems. But the African states uh, have simply accepted that those are the lines and everybody's trying to work within them. So similarly, um, the uh, Russians are now trying to Ukraine is not a real country, um, and it is. Uh, and those are the lines that uh, behind which uh, those the country is drawn, and they should just remain. There is no reason to be inflicting uh, this level of punishment, death, and destruction uh, on the people in in that country. Yeah, get uh, it's uh, the, the the last question, Minister, is, is just because I know you 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 you're limited, um, but. What what can the Bahamas do in 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 this situation? I mean, it, 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 what can we ha what effect can we have? Uh, how can we uh, take uh, either a stand or strike a blow to, uh, to to show our support for democracy or or any, what can we do? What can the Bahamas do? Well, I think uh, mainly inspired by some of these uh, FNM trolls online, I've seen this uh, sarcasm and cynicism by people uh, trying to make me a kind of thing that, uh, you know, Putin's going to come after me and all sorts of rubbish. Uh, meaning that I assume the, the underlying argument is that the Bahamas is so small, why are we getting in those people's business? Well, the point is that, uh, you know, one day they come for the other person, and the next day they come for you. And so you have to stand up for the principle. And what I say uh, everywhere is when your voice is all you have, you're supposed to use your voice. Even if your voice shakes, you're supposed to use your voice and say, I do not 
believe in that. I do not support it. Um, and it's uh, an analogous situation would be this. I mean, we go to funerals, for example, all the time. We can't bring back the dead, but we go there to show our support for the family, and it makes a difference to the family. So the people in Ukraine uh, who are being punished uh, unjustly want to know that there are other people who stand with them. And we know that when it comes our turn, there are people who stand with us, just as, you know, people, uh, when the hurricane took place, uh, people in the, in the uh, you know, who are friends who we do business with in South Florida, they didn't stand by and say, oh, well, you know, what can we do? The place is all ruined. Uh, we're not going to go there anymore. They went into action, collected goods, and they brought, brought goods to the Bahamas to help uh, rebuild the place. And they expressed themselves and gave us moral support. So that's what we can do. And we should uh, not allow uh, the Russians to fall into error on this by being silent. And so that's the first step. Uh, secondly, um, in the context of uh, supporting our moral voice, of course, is to uh, ensure that uh, that we support uh, the CARICOM position uh, on this. Uh, and I would say there's a practical issue, which is that, you know, the Russians spoke to me uh, at the expo in Dubai. And they want to have uh, their country showcased in 2030 uh, as a place of modernity. Um, and um, they therefore are seeking to get the license for the, from the Bureau of International Expositions in Paris to have an expo in Moscow in 2030. Well, they're, they're saying that they're going to be coming to the Bahamas and they're going to be coming to the CARICOM countries uh, over the next uh, year or so because the vote is in November of next year. Well, that's important to them. Uh, this is the point at which we have some leverage to say, look, you can't be uh, conducting yourselves in this fashion and then come asking us to support you um, for this, your country's not conducting itself within um, the usual international norms. And that's not, not something that we can support. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one sort of pressure point, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, and it's it it comes down to you know the in in the way that the world's architecture uh, has been sort of you know every country has a voice you know and and, and I, you use your voice if that's all you have as you say yeah I think so I think I think that's right uh, so the, the in, within the meetings uh, in down here in Belize there's a very spirited discussion about this. And, and the, you know, it's, it's difficult because, of course, we're all of us are joined at the hip to the United States. And it is difficult to have a conversation with your friends. I mean, the flashpoints in this region right now, for example, on Nicaragua, Cuba, uh, and Venezuela. Venezuela, yeah. You can't have, a, it appears that you can't have a rational conversation with U.S. any of these points. Um, Cuba, for example, uh, is, uh, is a part of the hemisphere. And um, there's an upcoming meeting uh, called the Summit of Americas, which takes place in the summertime. It's being hosted in the States by Los Angeles. And we understand that the United States has taken the position that Cuba, under no circumstances, will be invited to attend this meeting. But how so? I mean, they've been invited to all the, to the two previous meetings. Uh, CARICOM has stood up and said, look, you know, Cuba is a nation uh, for good or ill, who's part of the hemisphere. Um, you may disagree with them ideologically, but that is no reason why they can't sit at the table. We voted all of us against the embargo. Um, similarly, we understand that they're going to be inviting um, a fellow named Guido, who claims to be who they recognize as the leader of Venezuela, when in fact uh, he has no such standing. Um, so, you know, all of these, of course, are flashpoints, but because the U.S. Uh, they are our friends, it makes it difficult, I suppose, for some countries to have that conversation, and doubly so for us, because we're just 50 miles away, and uh, perhaps some more by them than any other country in the region. But if your principles are what they are, then you stand up for your principles, and I think that that's, that's important uh, uh, in, in, across the board, all these, all these uh, situations. For sure. Difficult, but uh, it's crucial for us to stick, I think, by principles. And and the CARICOM position, of course, uh, so far on this war is bad Putin. Stop it. A uh, young statement, uh, which will come out in a couple of minutes uh, about uh, the situation in Ukraine. 
Um, and I think it's not inconsistent with the position that was taken with regard to the U.S. and Iraq. I mean, it was just a misdeed, which should not have happened. Uh, but as I say, we had no, of course, material impact on any of these things. But the fact is, uh, if the principle is correct, I think you have to stand up for the principle. And that's that's what's taking place here. Mm -hmm. it, it, and, and I guess I'll, I'll let you go with that, sir. Uh, if, if you have any, any final thoughts about the situation, uh, you're welcome. We'd love to hear them. Uh, but uh, I, I'm yeah. done with my well, questions. Yeah, I, I think that uh, what, what interests me... Um, I got a call from one of your colleague, uh, colleagues, I guess, uh, I think his show is on Fridays, and it just interests me just watching from, uh, from overseas the response uh, to Bahamians on all of these uh, foreign affairs matters. You know, I previously, I don't think anybody cares about foreign affairs except when they lose their passports. Um, uh, it's just interesting to see the people in the commentary on this um, and realize that we you know, do have uh, some say and certainly some stake in where all of this ends up because if there's war in the world, um, it's going to affect us. It is already affecting us on so many levels. Um, and uh, we just have to, in our view, the principles, um, support the principle uh, because the principle is a good one for our own country and its territorial integrity. Um, and um, to turn to things we can do, I mean, obviously there's going to be a big campaign now for food security. Uh, there was a, a, huge, a, a very long presentation by the uh, president of Guyana yesterday on food security and what we can do to uh, begin to feed ourselves, which has been an aspiration of all of our leaders uh, from the time um, we all gained independence. So that's what's coming down the road. Uh, we've got to hunk it down. It is, this war is most unfortunate because in one country that uh, the revenues are 60% up of where they were last year. That's a significant achievement. And um, as the tourism people are saying, we have the potential now if we, get, if we are able to get rid of these COVID restrictions. I, mean, I was looking, for example, at trying to, to back uh, to Nassau um, on Sunday and... Uh, a seat, I think the 4.30 flight uh, or the 12.30 flight on American Airlines, one way to the Bahamas was $3,050, one way to Nassau, Miami, Nassau. That's Caribbean that's dollars, you, though. <laughs> or is that, that's, that's not U.S. dollars. U.S. dollars, $3,050, one way from Miami to Nassau, a 30-minute flight. Uh, so the demand is clearly high. I don't know who would actually pay that, but... You know, that's that's what I saw online. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank All you right. very much. I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll be Good. looking forward to seeing that uh, that statement uh, coming out of Caracom. Safe. Yeah. All right. Bye. 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 And uh, and that statement, uh, I have the statement here. It's a short one, of course, but I'd like to read it just so that uh, we have. Uh, the position of the Caribbean community, of which we are a member, uh, on the war, and it, the statement reads as follows. It says, the Caribbean community, or CARICOM, strongly condemns the military attacks and invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation and calls for the immediate and complete withdrawal of the military presence and cessation of any further actions that may enter the situation in that country. The recognition by the Russian Federation of the regions of Donetsk and Luhansk represents a violation of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. The hostilities against Ukraine of respect for sovereignty, territorial integrity, non-interference in the internal affairs of another sovereign state, and the prohibition on the threat or use of force, and the peaceful resolution of disputes, which are bedrock, which are the bedrock of this community. CARICOM maintains that the principles of universal respect and adherence to these norms and principles of international law are fundamental to the maintenance of the international system and global peace and security. CARICOM calls on all parties involved to urgently embark on intensified diplomatic dialogue to immediately de-escalate hostilities and work toward a sustainable peace. And that, Brother Edwards, is the CARICOM statement on the hostilities in the Ukraine. 
you know, so, the, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there's a lot to be unpacked from from the statements made by, well, the interview with the um, Honorable Minister of um, Foreign Affairs, but um, certainly it will become difficult for one to not line with um, some of those sentiments from a humanitarian point of view, and also from the point of view of uh, the, the interest that we have in a very um, and highly connected world. Um, you know, these things are, are, are just simply matters which are happening far away from us, but they have a direct impact on us. And, and the, the reality is, it is not inconceivable that we are going to feel particularly tangible effects from what's going on in the Ukraine. Uh, uh, the, some, some of the research that I've done just points to the, uh, the fact that with Russia as the second largest exporter of crude oil and the world's largest natural gas exporter uh, being cut off from the global markets, uh, you know, the, the, the prediction is that oil prices per barrel could uh, easily hit the $130 mark. And the former managing director of the World Bank, uh, Juan Jose Dabu, has suggested that most Caribbean governments may need to budgets by at least 20% this year to adjust for prior assumptions. Now, as an economist, you, you know that's not an easy feat to pull off. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I'm not an economist. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an individual who likes to read about economies and uh, maybe get into the discussion sometimes. Forgive, 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 forgive me, sir. I apologize. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes unwisely. But yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the number, Quincy, is frightening. If we put that within the context of, of the Bahamas, um, we already are sitting on a deficit of uh, $951 million, or to the extent which that may have reduced over recent times. But for mm. the country to go out and find additional funding for, um, sec for securing basically uh, energy costs for oil, it it's really frightening. If you, if you look at where we were over our lowest point during the, the, the crisis over the last two years, oil prices were down oh. in the 50s, maybe 60s, 70s. Uh, a price of 120 to 130 is effectively a doubling of uh, that situation, which means that whatsoever the input is, uh, for example, for us um, securing energy from BPL or any other entity, is going to double. Uh, and and, and that, that in, in and of itself is very frightening. Uh, again, the, the minister mentioned the fact that we are up about 60% on revenue, and that's a very positive thing. But the, that nascent um, recovery, could certainly be significant by this movement in, in, in world oil prices. And as a result of that, you know, could set us back just a little bit, uh, if not a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, just looking at, uh, at the crude oil prices now, uh, it, it's already over 110. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are some predictions that if, uh, if the ports are, are banned, that's Russian crude. We're looking at $150 a barrel. Uh, and and, and the, the one that worries me is the report that uh, $125 a barrel prices could push the U.S. into a recession. And yeah. the last thing we need mm -hmm. is for the U.S. to go into a recession. The, okay, first of all, let's go back to the Let's go back to the banning of the um, Russian oil imports, right? Mm -hmm. up, up to yesterday, up to yesterday, it was very clear that the, the Biden administration was firmly against it without saying it, okay? Right. But uh, as you are very much aware, you being a person who is still foreign policy and you watch these things, you understand that there's always one soul or many other souls, especially if they're opposed to you, who are always chipping away at your policy position. And it, it, it seems as if by this morning, that that position is, is showing some fissures. And yeah. it's, it's, it's likely to, to fall apart 
And the reason it's, it is likely to fall apart is because of the restriction that the United States face in terms of its involvement. It's, it's extremely difficult, as we would have seen with um, Crimea and when Russia went into, into Georgia. It's extremely difficult for the United States to have a direct participation in this. And so it will have to show its uh, utility through other indirect methods. And as, as, as you indicated, a, a ban on, on Russian oil is going to send the prices through the roof. Now, I don't know if that immediately push the U.S. into a recession, but certainly uh, the way I've described it is that it is going to send the inflationary uh, realities through the stratosphere. And that could then, if sustained, followed by a recession and you know, ultimately could even be a depression. And so the, the, this, this particular uh, hostility um, far as it may be, has some very, very, very serious implications for us here in, uh, in, in, in the Bahamas, for us in the region, and for many parts of the world. Uh, you, you, you refer to the export from Russia. There are many, many European countries, Germany included, that is significantly dependent on um, Russian oil. We, we know of the, the North pi Pipeline and the North 2 Pipeline, which was other things which will have knock-on impact. Uh, further depressing or further creating downward pressure on supply chains and, you know, just the supply of goods. I think you mentioned earlier somewhere of the, the level of export that comes from Ukraine and Russia collectively as it relates to wheat. And wheat is a, a main ingredient in a number of food sources around the world. And so that it's significant. There's no way to on the play the significance of this um, um, war on the, on, on the world economy. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and, and uh, to look at the view from around the region, um, Kevin Ramnerine, uh, the Trinidad and Tobago Minister of Energy, said, and I'm going to quote him, he says, freight costs are related to fuel prices. That's marine, gas, oil, and fuel oil. And mm -hmm. fuel prices are obviously linked to oil prices. Right. This means higher prices for food. Mm -hmm. on Right. So since 2020, the COVID-19 related supply chain issues and supply side deficits have exerted inflation food in the Caribbean, which we see uh, and the Food and Agriculture Organization's Food Price Index uh, confirms that uh, global food prices were already in 2020 as a year, uh, sorry, 2021 at a 10 year high. And, and we, we are now looking down the barrel of uh, even more uh, price uh, volatility, let's call it, in, in, the, in the global food chain. And, uh, and, I, and I, I just, I, I kind of want to paint a picture here. Uh, so you know, let's, I'm going to read, read through some more of the, the results from around the region. And, and then I want to I get into it for what this could mean for the Bahamas and how we should behave, right? So according to the results from the fourth Caribbean COVID-19 Food Security and Livelihoods Impact Survey, this is a survey administered by CARICOM, the World Food Program, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, and the FAO in February of this year. So this is less 88% of the people in the region have reported changes in their shopping behavior, and 93% have reported an increase in observed food prices. Uh, so that's, uh, I'm just going to let that sit for a second. And the FAO's sub-regional coordinator for the Caribbean, Renata Clark, said, and I quote, the Caribbean has been, has seen unprecedented increases in food security in 20, excuse me, food insecurity in 2020 and 2021 due to the social and economic disruptions provoked by the COVID-19 pandemic. The additional price volatility that would be brought on by conflict in the Ukraine will affect the most vulnerable in a region like the Caribbean, where so many countries still depend too heavily on food exports, excuse me, food imports. And then of course, you know, there's the direct issue of food. But I, 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 it was, I heard something in your voice there, Hugh. <laughs> you see, I, I, with all of that, right, 
you talk about the uh, supply side shock. We just went through uh, an event, and I'm saying went through because um, you know, we, we, we wanted to go away and we right. see the uptick, and so we're treating it as if it's gone. But right. we went through an But it isn't gone, let's be yeah, clear. No, no. Yeah, it's not gone. It's not gone, yeah. but you, you, you understand. We see, we, we see some light at the end of the tunnel, mm -hmm. and it don't seem as if it's a train coming. Um, the, the supply side shock was there. In, 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 in great relief. But there was also a demand side shock because you know they couldn't sell, we couldn't buy, right? Now the, the circumstances are changing a bit in that we have tourists flowing in and we have a demand for greater goods. So if you have a hotel filled with tourists, you have to feed them. If you have a hotel with no tourists, you don't have to feed them. So you have a demand side shock. Which is which was in play and kind of counterbalances as bad as it was. It kind of counterbalanced um, the circumstances. Now we are faced with having our tourism product, but we can't find the goods and the services to provide us the, 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 the level of experience that we want to give these individuals. And that is a problem, or that could be a potential problem for mm -hmm. organization for hotel because it's going to affect the profitability. Um, further, further on down the line, we we understand that right across the region, we have seen coming out of um, COVID that food security, as you alluded to, food food security is a big issue. I think now, uh, Quincy, one of the things that we must take away from both um, COVID and today this type of uh, hostility is that it is time for the Bahamas and it's time for the rest of the region to get very, very serious about its own level of internal dependency. And by internal, um, speaking of the Caribbean as a whole, there are great, um, great opportunities for countries, um, Jamaica, Trinidad, the um, Guyana, Bahamas, and so on and so forth, to forge greater relationships, closer by needs, driven by money and capital. Because when we go down the philosophical route of, you know, we are one Caribbean and we are one people, that don't work. But if you put some money behind it where, you know, you, you, you start to source your goods and services and you become a mutual market, I believe that there is greater potential there. There is growth, internal growth for the region. And of course, it makes the, the, the countries of the Caribbean that more resilient to shocks like these that we are facing. We have to get to that point, and I think the, the need is extremely urgent. Yeah, uh, the, the, the fact is, the, Russia and the Ukraine are considered by some the breadbasket of Europe, right? This conflict then has severe implications for both current and inflationary dynamics in our region. Uh, despite the fact that neither of those countries is a major regional trading partner. Um, look, looking at some of the statistics, uh, and this is uh, research quoted by Forbes magazine here, uh, re Russia and Ukraine account for a third of all wheat exports, accounting for something like 59 million metric tons, which is, uh, they also account for a fifth of the global corn trade and half of the world's sunflower products relating to, that translates to about 80% of, of global sunflower oil production. So it's no surprise that in the space of the few, the, the, the few days since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the price of wheat jumped to its highest levels since 2020, 2012. And analysts have warned that war can not only impact grain production, but double global wheat costs. And why that is important is because that means by extension, the, the cost of flour, bread, noodles, biscuits, and cereal, which are major components in a typical basket of goods for the poor and the vulnerable, will also have their prices double. And when you look at member states in CARICOM, which anywhere from 60% to 90% of their food supplies, the implications of, of, the, of the war, which may double the price of these wheat-based items becomes particularly, well, I guess it becomes terrifying, right? Yeah, because you're still dealing with COVID-19. 
which means our economies are still on the rocks and tourism is still struggling, even though there has been an uptick. Yeah, it, it, it's it's very frightening, Quincy. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, if the supply lines from Ukraine, and we're talking about the wheat wheat supply from Ukraine and Russia, um, reduces, which we anticipate it will, disrupted by um, the, the 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 current war, then obviously Europe will have to look elsewhere for its wheat, and that elsewhere is likely to be the place that we generally look. And the fact of the matter is Europe and other countries within the world are in a better position to pay a higher price for those goods and services. Mm -hmm. And they're likely to be in a, in, a, in a situation where, because we are highly tourism dependent, we have seen our kitty um, you know, significantly run down. So you're faced with a circumstance where the, the, the cost of staple items rice and flour and other forms uh, other forms in which wheat is used uh, could potentially double but you are at and it's happening at the moment when you are least able to afford that that is going to drive shortages on the home front it's generally going to um, result if, if, if that happens in increased prices could result in in, in rationing and so the, 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 the effect on the economy as a whole is going to be um, significant and severe, but there's also a sub or a derivative effect to that, which I think it, it is useful for us to single out um, Quincy. And that is those persons who operate at or below the poverty line, who are likely to experience and may very well now be experience a significant level of in coming out of this um, health crisis and the global crisis attached to it. Those these persons are going to be in a more significant way um, affected. If we then tie this argument into the the significant drain that we would have experienced on our social safety net, i.e., NIB or any other apparatus that we had in in place over the last 18 to 24 months, then you can see where we are. We are facing some headwinds, but we're facing them at a point where we are at our maybe weakest potential for dealing with those. And, and these have to be, they have to be given very serious consideration as to, you know, how it's going to affect the, the, the social fabric of the country. How is it going to affect the productive fabric of the country? How is it going to affect the recovering circumstances that we are faced with at this moment? And so, you know, we should not take these lightly. And I think this, this type of a discussion that we are having and you kind of, you know, digging deep into, you know, the news and the I and, and, and the research, which is important and persons must put this at the forefront of their mind when we think about, you know, what's happening way over. So. And, and, and it, it, it is, I want to, I, I, uh, Derek Nemhard, uh, he's the managing director of Jamaica Flour Mills. Uh, and he talked about the fact that, uh, JFM was forced to raise prices three times during 2021. And uh, in January of this year, he warned of a further price increase or more than one further price increase in the short term. He said the grain supply, uh, excuse me, this is a quote here. He says, grain prices have gone up, fuel prices have gone up, therefore ocean freight has gone up. And, uh, and, and he's talking about supply deficits unprecedented delays experienced between 2020 and 2021 and the large which all of that has led to the sector's largest price hikes in eight years so we're not talking about uh something that is we're talking about right now in jamaica mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying war the war stands to have a significant impact on the price of flour in our region during a time when supply chain issues coupled with low crop output in the US and Canada, which is where we get most of our grains, have been running up the global deficit of wheat, causing major regional price surges since the 2020. So this, and, 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 and uh, my research says it's not just Jamaica. This similar impact were felt in Barbados uh, that I could find in Guyana and elsewhere in the region. And, and this, this is not, I mean, it's not pretty. Right, because as well, the price surge 
You add fuel to uh, uncontrolled inflation and supply chain disruptions. Uh, and leaders uh, and economists, and this is a quote from, from the article in, in Forbes, uh, this quote says, already reeling from the, co the impact of COVID-19 on their respective economies have in many cases been blindsided by the happenings of the past week. And, and this is the important part of the quote, and no group stands to suffer more from the fallout than the poor and marginalized who were already feeling the financial brunt of the pandemic. Yes, and that's exactly the point I'm making, right? or I tried to make. When we, well, I think the, the, the proper context for this war, or at least the effects of the war is that we are grappling with the vagaries of the current crisis. And we are looking at ways at which we can recover. If you put it within the context of the Bahamas, we have, for the first time, seen debt levels, debt stock, which went well over 100%. Um, so 102, 103, you measure that. You are looking at a fiscal deficit, as was measured in the initial budget of about 951 million. And I think it was a borrowing need of somewhere about $1.8 billion. That was almost six months ago, uh, Quincy. Yeah. Today, 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 as we speak, a large portion of that need remains. A large portion of the deficit remains unfunded. We saw recently where the, the government did a repo uh, arrangement with uh, Goldman and Sachs, and that was a, a wonderful reality. Some persons do not see that way, but from my perspective, the fact that the government has the ability right now to demonstrate that it can borrow is a win. The fact of the matter, though, it's it, it, it was done in a very expensive way. It had to be done in a very expensive way based on uh, what the government realities are. High debt through the circumstances where, you know, we can't afford it. So here now comes an additional headwind, which is going to uh, very likely, and, and, we, and we're seeing it happen, we see it have started to happen already. It is going to now push further one of what was expected to be a lagging effect of the, of the COVID crisis, and that is inflation. And when you reason this through, uh, as, as you indicated, a country like the Bahamas that imports uh, you know, upward maybe of 80% or a significant amount of its goods is simply importing inflation, right? And if that inflation is now going to become significantly higher because of pressure, and not just pressure across the board, but pressure on some of the main commodities that we need to function, a large portion of that being our oil uh, or energy supply, then, you know, we are, we, we are going to be in a spot of bottom. Um, obviously, when I say we, it's not simply the Bahamas, it's a many other countries to now start to think, Quincy, with, with, the, with, the, with the issues that we have faced, we now need to start having, I think, a parallel discussion, and I'm sure that we will talk about a little bit of this um, um, later. The, the fact of the matter is that the realities are what they are. We are where we are. We are not as able as we would like to be to resist these shocks. The question is, you know, where are we going to be two years from now? Where are we going to be five years from now if this particular crisis drags out for another uh, 12 or 18 months? Where is the Bahamas going to be? So we have to go on a parallel track and now start to think about how we survive and how we plan to thrive in, in the future. So I want to shift a little bit uh, just to, again, drive home the effect uh, that this war is likely to have. Uh, and in the, in the second hour, Hubert, I think I want to talk a little bit about food security. Yeah? Um, the average American gas price uh, since the military attacks began 11 days ago have risen 13%, or 47 cents per gallon. 
Imagine if we saw a 47 cents per gallon hike in gas prices in 11 days. What would happen in the Bahamas? Uh, well, you know, I, I, I think it may be when we see that. Uh, this is my point. I, it's coming. It, it is coming. And I, I, I think it's going to throw a monkey wrench in a lot of stuff. Um, fuel is ubiquitous to the provision of goods and services. Um, we know that, uh, you know, in the family islands, fuel tend to be even more expensive than it is here in New Providence because of shipping costs and so on. And so we can expect that, you know, this is right across the board, like every single item uh, consumed is likely to see some increase. And uh, I, I think, you know, just going back to the, the time, the Forbes article that you quote from, you know, we are worried and we are concerned about um, all persons generally. But at some level, we can carve out Quincy Parker. At some level, we can carve out some other persons because, you know, all things being equal, they will survive. But there are a group of individuals within the country who who really going to feel it at a at a heightened level. And what I'm really, really more concerned about, Quincy, is the fact that this upheaval has the potential to push out further something, a, a phenomenon, which is I, I think we are going to experience having lost a number of our students in terms of their educational um, adventures for the last two years. There are many students now who uh, maybe have lost the opportunity for higher learning. There are parents or families who have to defer college. And because things are getting worse, that deferral may have to be longer, which then turn out to not be a deferral, but a total cancellation um, in the long term. These are some of the areas which I am concerned about because not only do they have uh, implications for those individuals, dire implications for those individuals, but they also have long-term implications for the ability of the country to grow and to develop and for the, uh, con the country to put itself in a position where it can afford the type of um, social support, which is going to be necessary and obviously necessary at a higher level than it is today. We have seen recently where discussion emerged that, okay, we are ratcheting down the social support and then boom, we see in the newspaper, there is contemplation that we have to make sure that this continues uh, for a while yet. And so these are, these are really, really serious concerns, which goes to the long-term productivity and um, potential for growth and development of the country. Yeah, I, I, for me, I, I feel like there is a level of gamesmanship that is that is that is to be expected in our in our local politics, right? Um, and and so I want to I kind of want to set a bar. That uh, that people who are paying attention to the political discourse uh, have have at least a minimum of of a foundation for how this war can and will affect our region and our country, so that as the, as the politicians uh, do their thing, we we have a, a a basis from which to hold them accountable to judge their behavior and their actions and their responses. But the fact is, uh, and this is the research now that, that shows that when, uh, when gas prices rise, you know, it, it creates a drag on the economy. Uh, and that drag impacts everything from consumer spending to the price of airline tickets, which of course will impact our tourism uh, economy uh, to hiring practices. Gas is an important input for transportation, of course, which directly impacts households as they drive, but also the businesses that rely on logistics and transportation chains. So all of our taxi drivers and tour drivers uh, are, are looking at a, at a knock-on effect if gas prices go up. Uh, if discretionary spending is hampered by high gasoline prices, the knock-on effects throughout the broader economy uh, are, are looking, I mean, retailers are going to have a problem. 
Uh, public transportation is going to have a problem. The auto industry is, you know what I'm saying? It's, yes. this is, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a simple or as, uh, as, as benign a, an effect as, as the distance from us may make it seem. It's not, it's, it's, it's absolutely not. And I think uh, the, the minister, um, Honorable Fred Mitchell, mm -hmm. he pointed out to something which I think uh, is very important and we must bear in mind. The tourism product as a business is dependent on people. The decision making around tourism for travel, for the leisure industry is based on disposable income. So one may be tempted to say, you know, we're distant from this and so we're, you know, our tourists is coming from the United States and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. the, the policy decisions that will be taken in the United States, and I think some of them is going to emerge as early as next week, the impact that the, the sanctions, um, the economics of the sanctions which are being levied um, on Russia across the world, because make no bones about it. When you sanction Russia, Russia isn't the only entity which is going to be um, impacted. As much as we um, may kind of turn our nose up at that kind of a Russian, there is Russian business within the region. I don't know if any is here in, in the Bahamas, but there's Russian business in the region. There's a Russian someplace renting a house and his money or her money is in uh, Russia or in some place and they've just been sanctioned and unable to transfer that money to the owner of the house. So it affects that individual economy. It affects other aspects that we do not readily see. And so we must bear in mind that these things are going to come down the pipe. And so going back to this idea of discretionary income, if there is pressure on discretionary income for persons in the United States, then the nascent recovery that we are seeing in tourism could be disrupted. And that has, too, an impact on where we are. 60% recovery compared to last year, that is going swimmingly well. If that then turns down, then all of a sudden we find ourselves making some, some backward slides, and that wouldn't be uh, you know, a, 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 a really good picture for the Bahamas at this point in time. And, and, and to be clear, you know, the, the Russian interests in the Caribbean are, are I mean, obviously uh, the three states that, uh, that the minister mentioned, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, have, uh, have significant Russian ties. But as, as, as you, I think, correctly pointed out, uh, there is a, a very good likelihood that un, un, unremarked upon or unseen or unpublicized, mm -hmm. there are significant business interests that Russia may have in the Caribbean, uh, maybe even here in the Bahamas. Yeah. Even that, indirectly. That we just don't know about. Exactly. And, uh, and that's, I mean, so the, the sanctions from the UK, the sanctions from Canada, the sanctions from the US, uh, may have, a, as you say, a knock-on effect uh, here uh, uh, to business here in the Bahamas as well. It's it's something for us to to, to really consider seriously. As as the minister said, though, uh, and I wanted to ask you about this. You know, you 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 stay true to your principle because it's a principle, even if that principle may mean going against, uh, relatively speaking, your your biggest trading partner and the largest source of your, your tourist market. Uh, so when, uh, when, it, when it comes down to it, and America comes knocking and says, you know, it's, it's time for, for the Bahamas to, to play ball uh, in, in some sense or another, uh, we're gonna have a, a, a very difficult set of decisions to make because as the CARICOM and as the Bahamas, our, our position is always non-interference in the affairs of the sovereign state. Yes. <laughs> so it's going to be very interesting when, when, that, when that phone call gets made. Interesting but not difficult, um, Quincy. I think if we, if we put on our practical and pragmatic hats, um, the question is faced with a decision of 
of not aligning with the United States, what exactly are the countries going to do? Well, the countries of the Caribbean are going to align with the United States. Obviously, you make certain pronouncements on the basis of, as the minister said, principle. Um, they're grounded in humanitarian concern. They're grounded in your belief in God or you know your 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 general spiritual outlook. But at the end of the day, when the rubber meets the road and the geopolitics um, chips in, you need to protect your interests. And that's what um, the diplomacy is about. That's what geopolitics is about. You have to protect your interests. And in any way, shape, or form, analyze the Bahamas, Jamaica, um, most of the English-speaking Caribbean, our interests are going to be greater aligned with the United States. The United States is highly aware of that. And so I think it was this week when there was the report of uh, the, the United States diplomats saying to the Bahamas, well, we want to see you making pronouncement about Russians not having access to the financial system. It mm. could be that you making a pronouncement and they are to be impacted. But strategically, it's important because we want to see where our friends are lined up and we want to know that they are lined up behind us. And so, you know, it's not very difficult, could be uncomfortable, but more than likely we are going to be lined up behind the United States. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I agree. And and I think it is going to be uncomfortable for some some of us in terms of, you know, the, the quote-unquote moral position. But, uh, but the truth is, we know where our bread is buttered, right? <laughs> yeah, there, you know, and, and there's there's a lot to be said. I have I have private views on on the, 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 the war and you know when you look at it historically and the relationship between Ukraine and, and Russia and the the implication of having Ukraine as a NATO um, country. You know, there are many ways to analyze that, but at the at the end of the day. You know, I am but one individual, and the our leaders, our our prime minister, those two whole seats of parliament, they don't have the luxury of a personal philosophical position. They have to do that which is in the best interest of the country. When they gather for CARICOM, they don't have the luxury of simply speaking about what is in the interest of the Bahamas only or Jamaica, unless that serves their purpose. And if it if, if, if they are going to take a lonesome position, then they also have to consider how that lonesome position may expose them and and be seen as a departure by you know one of your biggest trading partners. So it's it's, it's a very complicated um, um, situation. It's a very complicated circumstance. Uh, but I think the message uh, for all of us is to pay attention to it. Don't dismiss it because it has um, direct impact but also to policymakers to not treat this. And this is, uh, and I'm using policymakers broadly here, Quincy, even those who are not currently in power, to, mm. to treat this with a level of diplomacy and, and um, statemanship, which, you know, sends the right message. Because, you know, you don't want to be saying, want to find yourself in a circumstance which creates something which is uncomfortable, not only for you, but for a country or the organization which you represent um, tomorrow. Because you know, in the in in, in the realm of um, foreign affairs and politics and geopolitics, the memories are long. Mm -hmm. um, persons don't forget, you know? No, no, they don't, especially when something gets written down. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, moving, moving, moving the conversation uh, over to uh, what the last thing the minister said. You know, he talked about the fact that uh, there's going to be a quote-unquote big push in terms of food security. Uh, I want to quote a Trinidadian agricultural economist here. His name is Omar Daf Maharaj, uh, and he's called on uh, regional governments to rethink development policy and planning in agriculture in order to systematically reduce reliance on foreign food products and bolster capacity. Uh, Brother Maharaj says, and I quote, there must be a fundamental shift in the sector's priority, ra raising it on the national development agenda, which is to be supported by an overarching national policy framework for sustainable agriculture and rural development, unquote. Now, I had hoped to uh, have 
the Minister for Agriculture and Marine Resources, uh, the Honorable Clay Sweeting, on uh, on the show today to talk to me and uh, talk to the nation about the 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 government's intentions for uh, increasing food security at a at a critical time like this. Um, but it, it it seems to me that, and I want to ask you this, you know, we can't turn an economy on a dime. So, so what are our options? Uh, the options are many, and uh, I think that may sound strange um, to hear. The options are many. What is what is at play here, Quincy, is the time uh, for which we would like to see the benefit turn the economy on a dime, right? If if we accept that, if we accept that as a fundamental premise, uh, which is on, going to undergird our planning and forward thinking, right? Then we have to truncate our responses, I think, at multiple levels. So first and foremost, if you are hungry, if you're a hungry man, Quincy Parker, then the first thing you want to do is to find food, right? If that food is a, 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 a five a five um, a five meal gourmet, it don't really matter to you. Or if it's just a piece of bread, you need food, you're dying, you need food. So you have to satisfy immediately the need. And then you have to start thinking, now that I'm no longer as hungry as I was, I have to think about where am I going to get breakfast and dinner from tomorrow. And then I have to start thinking about where is that five this meal going to come from when I have a chance to go out with my significant other in five or 12 months. The idea here is we have to start building, planning for, and executing for the things that we observe we're missing today. So all of the things which we, we are challenged with, um, food, lack of food, the potential for uh, you know, uh, having our, our food security under pressure, the, the 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 reality that our economy is not as resilient as it ought to be, the fact that we are grappled with a high debt stock which we cannot get rid of in six months or 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 or, or, or two years, the fact that we have set some very ambitious target of having debt to GDP at um, 50% sometimes in the future and of course revenue to GDP at 25%, we must accept today, Quincy, that these are things which are going to take place or can be manifested or can be realized in two years, five years and beyond and start to work on those. If we do that, then my initial statement, which may have sound crazy, right, opens up the possibility. The things that we need to do today to survive are very limited. And so we have to make the best use of what resources we have. We have to have um, honest and very clear discussion with ourselves. We have to say to the country, as was done when there was the release of the, uh, of the recent fiscal report, the state of the nation's health, the nation's fiscal health is perilous. That was a one-line statement that spoke volumes of where we are. So we have to admit where we are. So from from a food security perspective, from an agricultural perspective, we need to now start to think, you know, what can we do with agriculture? Where can we look to learn some things? I see that the minister was traveling to um, Dubai, yeah? Uh, yeah, or one of those countries to do some research and gather information. Um, and that is fine. But there are also some other places that we may wish to, to take a look at too, and without any bias, maybe you want to look at Jamaica. Jamaica obviously has a larger agricultural sector uh, uh, than for obvious reasons. It has more arable land and so on and so forth. But there is also another aspect to that which is very similar to the Bahamas. Jamaica has figured out how to take its agricultural output and inject that in a very significant and fundamental way into its tourism output. We have long lamented in the Bahamas that, hey, 80% or 90%, depending on who you speak to, of the revenue from, from tourism goes back out of the country. 
And then we have also lamented that on the market side of agriculture, the market is very limited. Well, why not marry the two? Tourism creates a market. It may not be at the level that we want it today, but it creates a market. And agriculture creates a facility to which we can glean greater benefit yeah, from, mm -hmm. the, from the tourism dollar. What does that do, um, Quincy? The Bahamas have 400,000 people. If you see one day, if you ask somebody else, they may say it's 350 or 300, but forget about the number. What tourism does is that it injects hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of persons into our market. And therefore, it creates an internal market which we can use to help to, to develop and prepare our agriculture for export. Because ultimately, if you're only producing for the local sector, you know, you could see that as import substitution and that have its own benefit. But certainly, you know, if we can get to the level where we are exporting, and if you want to look at it at, uh, from a different perspective, selling to the tourism sector, selling to hotels is one level of export in my mind. The other level of export would be export on an external basis. So I, I do believe that um, if, the, if the Minister of um, Agriculture and the Ministry of Agriculture um, go back and look at some of the um, discussions which were made by the former Ministry of Agriculture, I believe they will find pieces of, of, uh, uh, of output which speaks to you know, us getting agriculture to be 1.5 billion of, uh, of our total GDP. Those are aspirational thinking, but I believe that it's a, it's a thinking in the right direction. And if we leverage some of our, 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 our sister countries closer to home and kind of figure out what they have done, I believe that um, the Bahamas can make some progress in that area. Yeah, it's, it, is, it is the realization of what uh, former Prime Minister uh, Perry Gladstone Christie used to call linkages, yeah? I mean, he, yeah. he, he, he preached about linkages from the beginning of, of, of one of his terms uh, until the end, and uh, no such linkages were, were institutionalized. Um, but the concept is, as you described, I think the, the clearly uh, one of the most uh, evident and available avenues that we have to to boost our agriculture and marine uh, output. Uh, the 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 challenge from the investor side of it has always been the ability to uh, supply the market in quantity and in quality and in consistency. And 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 so this is, I mean, this is the challenge, right? Uh, one of the things that um, Minister Sweeting said in uh, in Dubai, where he led a uh, um, sorry a delegation for the the World Expo, uh, is talking about you know using technology uh, and 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 saying you know the, the Bahamas could use things like vertical farming and aquaponics, mm -hmm. but also use things like building relationships between farmers and distributors. Um, and uh, and these are these are ideas that have been around, uh, and and for political reasons, obviously, you know, you have to present them as new ideas, and I, I don't have a problem with that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But but it, the 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 of an old idea as a new idea is politically par for the course. But what is important in this in this moment is actually. Executing. Yeah, you see, it don't matter where the idea comes from. I think I heard um, you know, one of these famous um, motivational or inspirational speakers says, um, some of the best ideas I have are other person's idea. Yeah. I, think we, I think we have to get to the place where we, 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 we operate with a sense of maturity um, to say, you know, it doesn't matter who started the idea. We have to um, figure out a way of using it and um, maybe taking it and refine it. As you talk about um, using technology, we see, I think it's Eden Farm with Carlos Palacios and some other young guys who are demonstrating that there's a possibility. Well, if they can take a couple of, uh, a 
couple of containers and do that successfully, then all that you need to do is to study that and scale up the operation. If we can do vertical farming, then we are to that. But we also have to, there are many, many farmers that exist in the Bahamas. We have heard stories, horror stories, about you know onions being dumped in, or tomatoes being dumped in exuma. Well, it, 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 that news, as bad as it is, has an upside. It says that persons can grow sufficient tomatoes, which mm -hmm. may need to be dumped. So what is missing from, the, from, from this equation? So the supply is there. What is missing is a market, or maybe it's the quality of the product. So if we now start to focus that we have individuals who are willing and have demonstrated their capacity to go out on the adverse circumstance and actually do this, why not then start to create a infrastructure or a framework of supporting entities i.e. BAIC, we need to upgrade them to, to be different. We need to find organization that looks similar to JAMPRO. You know, forgive me for kind of drawing on Jamaica so much, but that's that's kind of what I know. Um, you know, so when you have a JAMPRO and, 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 and export agencies whose focus is on getting entities or getting businesses to a level where they can export, you immediately start to address two things. You start to address the market because they're actively seeking market, but you're also focused on the quality. And where we are today, it will take us a while to get to that point. But if we get to this where the hotels no longer reject the thing because they're too small, they're too inconsistent, and so on and so forth, then, you know, we, we, we start to get ready for, for the external market. And then we start to say, how can we scale this up? How can we get more people by leveraging um, the, the, the small business development um, center to get persons into farming? How can we bring in more technology? How can government use its ability um, through policy and through concessions to facilitate uh, uh, greater, greater investment in agriculture? How can we therefore once we get to a critical mass, start to move to some forward integration. So we take tomatoes and we put them in. I understand, I've never seen it, but I understand that there was a point in time when the Bahamas was canning tomatoes, right? Yep. Or it may have been pineapples. What, if, if it was done then, it can be done today and it can be done in the future. And so all I'm saying to you, um, Quincy, when you ask what are the options, the options are many. Are they easy to, um, to, to realize? No. Can they be done? Most definitely, because if some other persons are out there doing it, it can be done. You know, when, when Shawnee Miller or Stevie Gardner step up to the starting line of a 400-meter race, right, they're not out there thinking, well, you know, these people are going to beat me, right? They mm. say, we're going to run them into the ground, regardless of where they come from, United States, Russia, Ukraine, United Kingdom, they don't care. They take their game to a world-class level, and they do the things which is necessary to condition them that when they get to that moment, they just prepare. They, they, they're they prepared, and they execute, and the execution of the country jumping up on people fainting, and then we win the Olympics. We can do it. It can be done, but it requires the type of discipline and dedication to get there. I, I think that's where it's at. Yeah, I, I want to I want to go back to something that you said earlier uh, in terms of scaling things up. Right, the 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 fact is that if you are paying, if you if no, oh, how do how do we say this gently? There's no reason to say it gently. If our governments were paying attention, right, the island school in Eleuthera has been working on sustainable uh, agriculture and aquaponics for more than a decade now. And they've been teaching students uh, from around the world who go to Eleuthera, learn aquaponics, learn sustainable agriculture, and then go back off to their own countries to, you know, do whatever they do. So the example of the, the example of a successful aqua aquaculture and aquaponics program already exists in the Bahamas. We already have proof of concept, and it's just. It's a matter of being to, as you say, uh, accept that my, some of my best ideas, to quote your quote, are other people's ideas. 
and, 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 and I find that we have this obsession with, with reinventing the wheel in order to put our stamp or the stamp of our color on the wheel when all we're doing is changing out one wheel for another, but we never ride the bicycle. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. and it, it's, it's, it's becoming, I mean, it has frustrated so many people that uh, in, the, in the 2012 election, there was a group of intellectuals, you know, the people who should be trying to run the country, who decided that they were, they were just going to opt out and not vote. Mm -hmm. These are the people you want in your political in, 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 in institution. And their, their choice was, you also lost, there ain't no point, so we vote. We ain't vote. You can spoil the ballot. Uh, you know, yeah. But anyway, so you know, uh, uh, Quincy, the, the well, the, the truth is right, and it's maybe a good example. I would be a little bit cautious in saying that there is proof of concept because um, proof of concept scale makes a difference. You know, uh, I can sell, um, you know. But you, I, I, I hear you. I hear you about the island school. Yeah. But the, 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 I challenge my, my only, my only cause or point for challenging you is mm -hmm. the point that you made, even though you say you've never seen it, the Bahamas has a history yeah. of exporting citrus to Florida, yep. uh, canning and, uh, and exporting internally mm -hmm. uh, tomatoes, uh, pineapples, and, uh, and all kinds of other stuff. My favorite guava jam growing up was Soya's guava jam, which was made in the Bahamas and canned in the Bahamas. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So it's it we the the concept is there's no question that it can be done. Yes. The 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 question has always been: Do we see this as a valuable and important? And now that we are facing a world with a global food shortage on the horizon, that 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 question has come much more into focus. Yeah, it, it, it certainly has, and you know, uh, I think one of the things that we're suffering, and not only the Bahamas, but um, many countries within the region, we're suffering from the the short cycleness which elections have created. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, political parties are in the business of winning election, and that's what they do. That's how a political party is successful, and consequently, sometimes long term visioning is counterproductive to that particular outcome. And so too often we look for the easy wins, um, which is going to get us to year two and year three, uh, give us a platform on which we can um, continue to discuss uh, and, 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 and to make a, a new proposition or expanded proposition to um, the, the, the voting public. What I think where we are right now in the country and is that we need to start to look a little um, long term. We have to start thinking that some of the some of the small cottage industries, you know, pick a few. Um, maybe government shouldn't be picking winners in the broad sense of things. But when you have no winners at all, it may be useful for them to pick one or two because when you have a particular product which you can get on the world market, which is associated with the Bahamas, which is associated with any country, it have its own um, advertising value. When you have certain foods or certain things which are associated with the country, it expands the offering when tourists come into, into the country and say, hey, you know, I don't want that jam. I want some soya jams, okay? All of a sudden, soya, which was only selling about five bottles per day, now start to sell 20 and maybe get a call from Atlantis say, you know, bring me five boxes per week. That is how you grow industries. That is how you grow economies. I, I know from observation that, you know, there are many, many entrepreneurs in the Bahamas that does um, these foods and jams and spices and so on and so forth. One is Davinias. I'm, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. Divanias. Yeah, yeah Divanias. But uh, I mean, have you seen it in, a, in, a, in, a, in any store in Canada or New York or Florida as you would see a product from Grace Kennedy in Jamaica or, you know, one of those countries, other countries? I think we have, we have to now start to think about how do we make 
the Bahamas, more than just its uh, tourism product internally, more than just the recognition from, you know, some of our athletic endeavors, more than um, talk about junk, you know, how do we get a productive output, things which actually sell for money outside of the borders of the Bahamas into the international market, earning foreign exchange, and leveraging that for, you know, clout or for um, public relations, whatsoever it is. Mm -hmm. Let's take a couple of guys, diviners or whatsoever, the ones which have potential and help make them winners. I think the country is going to benefit from it. And the same thing would, 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 would be a knock on within the agricultural sector because these guys are making, uh, are making products from the output of agriculture. So you sell the nice, fancy, smooth one to the tourists, and then you sell the ones which are not so smooth to these guys because they're going to be chopped up anyway and put in a bottle. So, you know, uh, we, we, we have to really start to think, you know, out of the box and think, well, not really out of the box, but just think broadly and think mm -hmm. creatively as to how we can make things happen. Yeah, I, I, and, and I, I'm so happy you said that. The, the, uh, the Access Accelerator Small Business Development Center has a partnership right now uh, that they are working through with the Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines to put Bahamian hot pepper sauces in, in, the, in the cruise ships. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, you know, the, the, the partnership is, uh, is already, you know, on a, on a pretty good footing. And so this is a perfect uh, opportunity for those sauces that are partnering uh, with the Access Accelerator in this program to get that super because it isn't just, you know, it's not just going to Americans, but it's going to whoever's on the ship. And you know, those ships have a multinational uh, passenger list. So, so yeah. there's at least, as I say, there's at least one agency that is working in that direction. And, and I think that, that you're absolutely right. That, that is the way to go. And, and uh, that Quincy, that Quincy, even though we don't think about it because we sell in this um, box of spice right over the wharf, right down there, uh, we can sit and see the ship, right? We don't automatically see that as export, but it is. It mm -hmm. is export, and it's going to earn a foreign exchange, right? And so, you know, we have to rethink or, or reorient ourselves about how we think about creating markets, because at the end of the day, it don't matter what you produce. If you don't create the markets and you don't service those markets, there's nothing to be gained. And you know how wonderful it would be if you have uh, another agency which actively support the small business development in terms of going out and sourcing these markets. That's all they do. Finding the markets, individuals to get their products to a marketable level, help them to scale up and ultimately help them to get into the export um, um, slipstream. I think that would be a wonderful thing. I agree, I agree 100%. I, I believe that that is, that is a, a, that's the next level of the program, uh, but, but it's, it's exactly, it's very exciting to me. Uh, you know, and, and it's like around the region, you know, Hubert, people are calling for a response uh, to, to the current circumstances that would see, uh, as you're talking about, you know, a gradual reduction in a dependence on imported fossil fuels and mm -hmm. the substitution of wheat and corn imports with locally grown crops like cassava a greater emphasis on local agricultural production, on value added, on international trade, coupled with, you know, maybe, maybe even temporary fertilizer subsidies to off, offset the increase in input costs. Because keep in mind now, uh, the, the Russian exports of ammonia uh, are translated into fertilizer at uh, I think it was more than two point something million tons imported into the Caribbean in the last year. Uh, and, and so some subsidies to offset those might even be useful in the short term. Um, but I wanted to, to, to quote uh, Chris Blackman, uh, who is Barbados's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations and uh, other international organizations in Geneva. And he believes that, you know, the current circumstances are yet another wake up call surrounding the heavily debated issue of food security for small open economies that are heavily reliant on food imports, especially at a time when they're still within the clutches of what he called a major dislocation brought on by COVID-19. So Blackman says, quote, 
This really underscores both the interconnectivity of the global economy and the inherent vulnerabilities faced by many, many developing countries, particularly small island developing states. Now, more than ever, there must be a redoubling of efforts to building a resilient food security architecture where really vulnerable states can withstand the myriad of existing exogenous shocks such as these, unquote. So it's like from around the region, from around the world, from internally, uh, and, and from just our conversation here today, just you and me, uh, the, 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 the path forward in terms of responding uh, as a country to what is going on in, in, in the Ukraine is, is very clear. And it is, it is a response that is bigger than just insulating the country against the war in Ukraine. And I, I, I'm going to take a, a, a big leap here and go out on a limb and say that it is a response that has been delayed for far too long because we've been talking about food security ever since independence. As, as, as the Minister of Foreign Affairs himself has said, ever since we became independent countries, CARICOM has been talking about food security. And, and so it's, it's time and past time for us to, to, to recognize that this is not a, a, a talking point, but this is something that our nation needs to survive. Uh, yeah, you and you're right. You know, one of the, you know, CARICOM is obviously an important organization within the region, but you know, when you look at at, at, at these these um, coming together, these 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 groupings, you know, you really have to go back and look historically at you know how did we get here? We get to CARICOM from the Federation, which you know. I think the statement was 12 minus 1 equals 0. Um, that would have been Jamaica flexing its muscle at the time, or, mm -hmm. or one of those other big countries, which basically saying, you know, you guys over there, you know, you, you can't do without us. Then you look at the, 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 the trend with CARICOM. CARICOM say, they, they, you know, and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be disrespectful here. They say a lot of things. Mm -hmm. they, this idea of food security suddenly becomes a very prominent and dominant um, right after 9-11, when in no, no time flat, all of our, our shelves were, were empty. And then we went back to normal. Yeah. And then the, here come COVID, and it becomes another very dominant um, discussion. During, 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 during the, the heights of the crisis, I've sat on a number of Zoom calls with even ministers from some of the small small islands within, within the region. And they were talking about this, you know, through, through Carrie Cham, that is the, the umbrella organization for the, 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 the chambers within the region. And they were very serious, and you get the impression that something is going to be happening. And we are now, again, faced with another set of crisis. But I want to draw your attention to, to, to something, Quincy. When we talk about uh, food security, right, too often we pay too much attention to the physicality particular issue. And the physicality is only one aspect of it. And so in, in, in many ways, when we're talking about food security, we ought to be, we are actually having a conversation about national development and social implications and so on and so forth. Because, you know, if you go to the United Nations the definition, United Nations definition of food security means that all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meet their food preferences and dietary needs for an active and healthy life. When you put food security within the context of that, many, many in the region, many, many in the Bahamas, in, 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 to, for that matter, do not have food security. Because it's one thing to say, um, you know, Quincy have a big pile of mango over there for sale. So it's a physical mangoes. But Edwards over here have absolutely no money to buy the mangoes with. So 
Or all I'm eating every single day is mango, 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 and whatsoever nutrients is captured and encapsulated in mangoes. That's all I am getting versus the other nutritious nutrition value that I may need to, to lead a healthy lifestyle. Or I may be, for example, um, a, a, a Rastafarian, yeah? who don't eat certain meats or certain foods, but I am unable to afford the other type of foods which is useful for me. So my food preferences and my dietary need, because I'm sick, I have uh, diabetes and certain foods I can't buy, I shouldn't be eating, but it's the only thing I can afford. How many persons within this country, we talk about um, non-communicable disease, diabetes, for example, who shouldn't be consuming a lot of um, carbohydrates and so on and so forth. But when you look at their economic circumstances, that's all they can afford. And so what they do, they eat it because they don't want to die and their circumstances get worse. So we have to now start to think about food security beyond its physicalness, about the broader and wider impact it have and how it stands as a measure of success and growth and development within a country. How successful are we in terms of providing what is needed for individuals within the country to secure the type of foods that they need to run their lifestyle and to be productive and to grow the country as we will get to in 2025 or not 2025, in 25 years from now. But you know, it's a really broader discussion. But of course, in the first instance, we have to start with the physical and the physical um, in many instances is, is not there, but it should not be limited to a discussion around the physical aspect of food. I agree with you a million and a half percent. Um, and I, I, I think that the, the challenge of cyclical political administrations uh, is that when that revelation is uh, encountered by somebody in the political directorate, uh, they only have a certain amount of time to try to preach the message. Mm -hmm. And if, if the, the trend holds true and, uh, and they are ousted from office, then the message dies with them. And then we have to wait for the next guy or the next lady to, to, to catch the revelation and have a Damascus Road experience. And, uh, and, and the same thing happens again and again. Uh, so so but, but, but before, but before you shift that thought though, Quincy, Mm -hmm. um, I think you 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 are hitting on. Uh, I mean, even though you say it very casually, you are hitting on one of the most fundamental challenges that we have in governance and in developing the country, right? And that is the extent to which you have a facilitation for transitioning good ideas and killing bad ones, all right? Uh, and, 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 and the, the extent which we can get to a place where we set a broad lung which captures at least directionally where we want to go, what we need to do, and have, regardless of whichever party is in power, whichever administration working towards that, is the extent to which we are going to solve that. Because the... The, 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 the stop and restart, the look and refocus, the re-envisioning, the re-strategizing and the recreating of a new path is in and of itself going to consume time, going to consume effort, and going to consume resources. And so we have to find a way where we make that a little bit more seamless. And we also have to create, I think, um, a, a circumstance where there is actual real transitioning from one administration to an next. It can be that you know you lose them tomorrow, you're gone, and then we just don't talk to you anymore. We have to get we have to get to the place where there is an obligation, an obligation, whether it is um, written in law or based on convention, which is respected, where we facilitate seamless handover so that the government continues and we don't lose time um, with, 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 with a number of things, you know. Yeah, uh, you, you, you're not wrong. Um, I guess the, the, uh, the hard question is, so I, I got two questions for you uh, based on, on, on where we are now. 
Uh, the first is how specifically do you think uh, we can keep costs down as they are influenced or impacted by the, the war in the Ukraine? That's the first question. And I, I mean all costs, obviously food, uh, uh, energy, uh, and, uh, and the second question is, uh, how worried should Bahamians be, in your view, about uh, this war and its effects? Take the second one first. How worried should we be? Obviously, we don't, we don't want to be running around like Chicken Little and say that the sky is falling. Um, we obviously should, I think, maintain a healthy level of concern um, regarding how it will impact our normal day-to-day -day, um, lives, how it will impact our organization, how it will impact government financing, and the potential for it to push the world into, you know, hyperinflation or recession and depression. So uh, I think we should, we should maintain a heavy level of concern not get overly worried. Uh, once we get to that place, and we want to get to there with a sense of calmness and awareness, and I think, you know, hopefully discussions like these help to inform individuals of what the issues are, and you kind of take them in strides. You have to then readily come to the point where you understand that you'd have to start making some adjustments. You have to make adjustments in your personal life. If you are running an organization, you'll have to make adjustments in running that organization. And certainly running the country, you have to make adjustments in, in running the country. You know, if your argument or your position uh, hold true, the one you made at the beginning that we could see oil prices rise and persons may need, and countries may need to be making allowance for an additional 20% um, for energy costs. If that holds true, then obviously the government with a, uh, a finite range from which it, uh, you know, accrue revenue will now have to start reprioritizing um, some things. And it means that some areas uh, will, you know, will, will, will receive less. It could be education, it could be health, it could be just any number of areas. As it relates to reducing costs, uh, you know, if if the economic arrangements in the country are real, in that you don't have any, you know, artificial means of persons um, increasing costs, if there are no behavior which are approximating to, 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 to cartels, if there is no abuse of uh, monopolistic um, positioning, if those, then clearly, you know, there's not much that you can do in terms of reducing the overall cost at a macro level. If some of those things are present, then obviously you can put some work in, you can use through moral suasion, like I saw the prime minister um, try to do with the retailers to say, hey, you know, just in case you are you know, kind of pushing the price up, why not um, you know, just think about not doing that? But the, the, the effectiveness of that is always going to be limited because persons will just come back to you and say, this is my cost structure, and this is what I have to charge. But uh, at, a, at another level, um, from a government level, obviously, there has to be a response. If there is a significant increase in, say, um, the cost of energy and other um, required input into the economy, then the government will have to um, start to think about what type of austere measures it may put in place to reduce the, its spending, its expenditure in um, certain areas. Now, does that automatically translate to reduce costs? No, not necessarily, but it reduces access to services from the government. And uh, in a way, it's kind of a you know backhanded way of levying um, some type of a pressure tax. Tax increased taxes would maybe have the same effect where the 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 the, the, the government asks you to pay more. Uh, but if that's not a likely scenario given where we are and our sensibilities to taxes at this moment. So it's very likely that the government will you know, start to say, you know, ministries, uh, ministers, departments, we want to see a 10% cut across the board. We want to see a 20% cut across the board. And that then translates into diminished um, services. So I, I think that is the likely scenario which is going to emerge. 
on the individual basis, Quincy, I would say to you, you know, don't buy that extra dessert with your lunch, you know, save it for lunch tomorrow. Don't go to the expensive place you used to do, go, you know, reduce it because there are economic adjustments which must be made, which will need to be made if you are going to survive um, in, a, in a reasonable way over, over the next short while. You are, you are on the one hand saying not to be worried or overly worried running around like chicken little. Yeah. But on the other hand, you are advising uh, conservation of resources. Yes. Uh, you know, sometimes the state of worry, worrying um, and doing that in an uncontrolled and, 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 you know, unthinking way in and of itself creates more problem than the problem itself. So, you know, in a nutshell, I'm not saying that there's not cause to be concerned, but we have to go about it in a, in, 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 in a very deliberate and thinking and intentional manner because, you know, you don't want to end up um, creating more hurt to yourself, whether within your personal economy or the wider economy of, a, of an organization or the country. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and finally, Hubert, uh, let's, let's take a few minutes to, to really consider uh, how, as a state player in the international arena, can exert its influence in, in regard to this particular situation. Uh, I mean, you, you've, you've been observing affairs for a while. So what can the Bahamas do uh, as, a, as a, an independent state with a voice in the international arena? They, the Bahamas can do as the Bahamas has done up to this point um, to clearly express their disagreement and concerns with the fact that there is a war, there is a escalation of hostilities. The the truth is, and I think you know we have to accept this. It's not it's not a bad thing. It's just the reality of where we are geopolitically. We don't have the type of clout of um, the United States or the big countries. We are not in a position to levy uh, sanctions or to cut off um, economic support, which would have... But we also have friends, and uh, we can line up behind our friends because when we do that, our friends appear to be stronger. And so I think, generally speaking, we are aligned with the West and the thinking of the West. And so we can continue to support organization as we would have done in CARICOM. We can continue to support any pronouncements which are coming out to the United Nations. We can continue to support where we agree and there isn't any fundamental disagreement because I believe, as the minister indicated, if you do this on a matter of principle and there is a fundamental disagreement, then you should at least um, indicate that you you do so. So, you know, for the most part, if we don't have any fundamental disagreement with the United States, then we can support those positions. And overall, if they, we are called on by our friends and partners to do things like uh, make a declaration that uh, certain access to our financial systems are not available to certain nationalities, then we do that. Even though we, in the back of our mind, we're thinking, well, there's nobody there to be impacted. Um, symbolically, it's Im Im important to do that. And we also, therefore, have to play a part in terms of, we can play a part in terms of appealing to the sensibilities of all parties, whether it's Russia or Ukraine or the external players, um, whether United States or other NATO countries, that in doing whatsoever it is that you're doing, you know, be measured, um, recognize that at the end of the day, whether they're Ukrainians or Russian, there are human lives at, at, at risk, there are persons dying. Um, there is a, a global reality that you do not go further than is necessary and create an um, indirect impact uh, you know, push the country, push the, the the world into a global recession. So do what is necessary. We support that, but you know, let's do so with a sense of 
um, responsibility, being our brother's keeper, and let's also do so consistent with the ideals and values that we support as a country. And you know, we 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 we. we we operate on, on those ideals. We are not moving away from them, and we will support that, and the world should know that. I think that's as much as we can do as a country. And it may not seem like much, but it is a lot at the end of the day because I, I, I do think that when you speak to the conscience or the, um, you know, if you will, the psyche of a circumstance, you know, you can change minds. It, it, it's possible. <laughs> And, and my, my, last, uh, my last quote and sort of the last uh, point that, that, uh, that I want to uh, briefly uh, touch on today is the fact that, you know, the Bahamas is a part of the global system uh, uh, that currently holds sway uh, in terms of international affairs. And I want to quote uh, James Stavridis. He's a retired uh, U.S. Navy admirable, admiral, sorry, <laughs> and he's the former NATO commando, commander in Europe. I believe folks may remember his name, James Stavridis. But what he said uh, in in a discussion with the uh, New York Times editorial staff was, and I quote: "The global system was built in the 1950s." And if you think of it as a car from those years, it is battered, out of date in some ways, and could use a good tune-up. But it is still on the road, rolling along. And ironically enough, Vladimir Putin has done more in a week to energize it than anything I can remember." Unquote. I, I think Stavridis is right. You know, the, the fact is, uh, the world for a while, uh, if you break it up into countries and you break it up into people, uh, people have, have long sort of been losing confidence, so to speak, in the world order, right? The, the, and, and the idea delivers. And uh, elsewhere in that New York Times editorial, uh, the, the, the writer points out that uh, President Biden in his inaugural address called democracy fragile. Mm -hmm. And that uh, Putin said two years ago that the quote unquote liberal idea of the world order had quote outlived its purpose. And uh, Chinese leader Xi Jinping extolled the strength of an all powerful state. And last March he talked about self-confidence in our system unquote. So, while people have acknowledged that democracy has been under attack and the, the democratic rule of law that has been quote unquote the world order for the for the last 50 years uh it, it seems that with the war and the response to the war uh we're talking about you know germany pouring 100 billion euros into its defense budget and halting development on the Nord line that you mentioned earlier. We're talking about Switzerland freezing the assets of Russian oligarchs, or that um, even as far, even even YouTube, as well as the World Cup soccer and global global energy companies all cutting ties to Russia. Uh, people contemplating a no-fly zone. Uh, countries like Finland. Uh, you know, going against decades of, of international policy and shipping uh, military hardware uh, to the Ukraine, it, it's it's uh, it seems that the world is waking up to the utility of the that same liberal world order that's mm -hmm. been on life support for a while, and yeah. I think that speaks uh, that that's a, a positive development. Uh, out of all of this, eh? Yeah, it could be a good takeaway. I know that the the admiral, I you have to say, the admiral espouses a a Western view, and um, in discussing these things, I think we have to be as broad as possible. Uh, one Quincy, even though you highlighted those positive, is that there is there seemingly a rehardening between democratic thinking 
and socialist thinking. And I, I think we are seeing bits and pieces of shadows of the Cold War era emerging over the last couple of weeks. So, you know, don't be too definitive on the car still putting along. It may be a totally different car. We just need to um, give it some time to realize exactly, you know, what type has it transformed to. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think that that, uh, we, we, there, are, there are some positive takeaways in that the world is pulling together to an extent, but uh, it, it is still something that we must, uh, we must watch for because uh, the fact is, it, this is the only world that we have. And when you have a, a, a guy like Putin who's, who's trying to reconstitute the USSR, in my view, uh, the, the, the nations of the world need to pull together and stamp that out. Yeah, there's portions of the world, and for every Quincy Parker who would think that um, Putin is a bad guy, there's another person over there who's celebrating him. So, you know, we have, to, we, have, we have to be mindful of these things, and we have to go about it while we, on this side of the world, don't support that type of a behavior. We have to be mindful that it's a, it's a delicate circumstances, and we would rather to see diplomatic solutions rather than hostility. Absolutely, absolutely. And with that final word, Hubert Edwards, thank you very much, uh, Brownstown, for joining me for uh, what has been uh, a rich and fulfilling discussion. I appreciate you, my brother. And uh, may God bless you and keep you. And uh, I guess we'll talk to you again. Uh, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Some of the time. Thank you very much, Hubert. And that's going to do it for us here on The Political Review, folks. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And uh, keep, keep watching uh, and make sure that you, you keep informed so that you can hold your people accountable. God bless. Yeah.